Hello, this is Stephanie. And this is Brian. Welcome to the making and the remaking of a codependent mind. We're going to pick up where we left off last episode and talk about the ways in which you can use lying, resentment, and defensiveness as tools to answer that big question we keep hearing over and over again, am I being codependent? Right. And it could be, this could be, am I being codependent or was I codependent at some point throughout my life? True. Although I think the more pressing one is, am I doing it now? Yes. Am I doing it now? So like we started to talk about in the last episode, the presence of the behavior of lying or the emotions of resentment or defensiveness are a sign that something's amiss in the relationship. And those things should be looked at with curiosity because there's signs that I'm not being authentic somehow, that I'm not actually genuinely valuing and honoring what we've talked about before, this three-legged stool, the me or the you or the us. But instead, I'm doing some kind of habitual default, which is what I've always done historically, to defend something which is not one of these three things, which is more of an idea of, of that I feel I need to defend in order to be safe. So these are signs that you feel under threat in the relationship or that you feel the relationship itself is under threat. And so you default to choosing attachment over authenticity, which is something we've talked about before, these fundamental needs, a need for attachment and a need for authenticity. And the way that you were conditioned to maintain your attachments as a child was to suppress your authenticity, to suppress your own needs and desires, pretend to be someone who you were not, ignore your own emotional pain. In other words, lie. And be codependent. Let's remind ourselves, since we're asking this question, am I being codependent, what we have said about what being codependent means. And I think we could actually read a brief passage directly from the book. I think you say it very well there, describing what codependency is, the set of learned behaviors, and what being codependent means. You want to read that passage? Sure. So this is from the book. Codependent behaviors are learned strategic adaptive responses to feelings of powerlessness to emotional pain. These behaviors function as a solution to the pain and or powerlessness people experience. Unfortunately, the solution is not effective in the long run. Once the behaviors become habitual and disordered, they are maladaptive in that they counterproductively cause more pain and powerlessness than they relieve. Of course, we say a lot more in the book of what these behaviors actually are, but the main point here is that I was choosing inauthentic behaviors, behaviors that weren't actually coming from a place of need, my own need or desire, but from were coming from this place of threat, threat response. Part of the reason they became so entrenched and so habitual is because they were strategic and adaptive at the time in which they developed. You were powerless, and these responses made sense at the time. So there was this feedback loop. You would do the behaviors. They would work to maintain the attachment. You would repress your own needs or desires or emotions, and that would be effective in maintaining the attachment. But again, problematic. By the time you become an adult, these behaviors are counterproductive. They are producing more pain and more powerlessness than they are relieving. Yes. We should just mention briefly here, we're talking about adult intimate relationships, whether romantic or friendship or sibling. Other relationships might have other rules like work environments. Or So again, these behaviors are causing pain and powerlessness. So it is an important question. Am I being codependent? Yes. So pretty early on, I didn't need to actually use these behaviors, but I continued to because I felt as though I needed to. This was just how I learned how to interact with people. So I saw everyone as a threat, but I actually started to have choices of who I could interact with. But instead, I didn't feel as though I, I could make that choice. So everyone was a potential threat. Every threat needed to be diffused. The only way I knew how to diffuse threats was through lying, dishonesty, codependency. Inauthenticity, yeah. Yes. But like we talked about last episode, you did not see yourself as a liar. You did not register these lies. And in part, because any time that strategy was challenged, this strategy of inauthenticity, this strategy of lying, that would kind of immediately bring in your inner lawyer. And that inner lawyer would immediately start rationalizing why you 
had to make the choice that you made. Yes, right. Exactly. Why there wasn't a lie that it was appropriate, that it was reasonable. And you had a really good inner lawyer. <laughs> yes. Well, and part of the reason being that I severed my emotions from the lawyer. My lawyer was very Spock-like. <laughs> it's just like, here's the facts. Or here's how I can twist the facts to make this fit. Because my emotional system was working the whole time, but it was useless to me. You know, it was, it, I, I couldn't use it. So you had the situation where your inner lawyer, which we all have one that we use to justify ourselves and rationalize our behavior, especially when we don't feel great about it. He got really strong. He thought he was in control and, you know, he stepped in on any, in any situation without even, without even knowing the real facts. So it almost went, you know, you went too quickly. I'm thinking of the TV show Law and Order, which probably ever seen some version of it. It's been on TV for a million years. Yeah, right. Yeah. It starts with this little monologue. I'll read it. In the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups, the police who investigate crime and the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you went right right to the court. I right to the courthouse. Yeah, forget about the the detectives. You, yeah, you forget about the detectives, which is which is what you want to do. Mm-hmm. That's where you want to spend your time because they're supposedly, I mean, Obviously, in real life, this doesn't always play out this way. But supposedly, they're there to figure out the truth. They're doing the investigative work to say, what is the truth of this situation? They're gathering the evidence. They're gathering the the relevant evidence. evidence. Yeah, and the relevant evidence. And as you're saying, your emotions were severed. You didn't didn't do that part. You immediately Mm -hmm. went to rationalization. And problematically, your inner lawyer almost always acts in defense of the other person, <laughs> excusing and rationalizing their behavior. Yeah, unlike this sentence here that actually talks about the uh, attorneys prosecuting the offenders. No, that's no. not what I did. I, I was a defense attorney, only a defense attorney. I either defended everyone else, no matter who they were, what they did, including what they did to me. or And then I figured out a way to defend myself, too. Just like, oh, yeah, this, I, this, this is appropriate. This relationship's appropriate. I do like this. Yes, that's why I'm doing it, because I like it. I like this person. But the problem is that there are crimes being committed. (laughs) There's like property crimes and financial crimes and mostly emotional crimes. And you are using your rational function to deny your emotional pain. If we go back to that book that we both really like, we mentioned before, The Body Keeps the Score. The consequences of those crimes were still being felt in your life. There were crimes against yourself and crimes against you committed by other people and you were bearing those consequences even though the little lawyer was saying oh no it's fine you know everything is good everything is is this is why it all is okay and not really but you were feeling the consequences of those crimes right well you know my lawyer was so good that my lawyer found other reasons for me feeling bad like depression or anxiety or something just this generalized thing that i have or work stress or yeah work stress there was always something i could find that sounded acceptable that wasn't the reality and a big part of the problem is like we talked about a lot there's nothing wrong with the particular behaviors that make up codependency and you put this really well in chapter nine of the book Mm -hmm. so you want to read that section uh it says people pleasing and caretaking are codependent behaviors but there's nothing codependent about pleasing people or caring for others Avoiding my own wants and needs by always prioritizing others' needs is a codependent behavior, but that doesn't mean there's never a time or a place to prioritize other people's needs. Feeling personal responsibility for other people's painful emotions and trying to diffuse them isn't the same thing as empathizing with other people's emotions, being present and feeling a desire to help them. The motivation behind these behaviors matters. So we have the situation where two people could be behaving outwardly in exactly the same way. And we want to say one person's behaving codependently and one person is behaving authentically. But it can be very difficult, especially when you have this well-developed inner lawyer who can turn any kind of codependent behavior into an argument that you are acting appropriately or authentically. Some kind of noble behavior. Oh, no, I'm just caring for people. Yes, Yes, and I care for this person, so why wouldn't I do this? Mm -hmm. Or I'm an empath, as I've heard people say or something. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) What we're talking through is how do you act more like a detective and less like a lawyer? 
So you're not litigating this. This isn't an argument for or against pleasing this a person or care, caring for a person. It is an investigation into what is the reality of that relationship. So we have a few suggestions on how to be a detective in that situation. One way to start is to look for patterns. Because again, these were habitual responses and ways of interacting with people in your life. So if there's a particular pattern that shows up again and again, particularly in your dysfunctional relationships, and it if it's happening again in a current relationship, then that might be a sign. That could be a starting point, right? Again, like you said, this is just a basic fact for starters. So it's just a starting point to Mm -hmm. go, yes, I have a history of what may appear to be lopsided caretaking or something along those lines. Looking for patterns is a good way to start. And then also then you can collect the facts and circumstances, some of which will end up being meaningful and some will not thinking kind of broadly, big picture about the circumstances under which this behavior is is happening can be helpful. But the most important thing, the thing that you didn't look at again and again and again, and you mentioned this in that passage of the book, is motive. Yeah, motive, right. What is motivating these behaviors? What emotions are animating these behaviors. So I wasn't looking for that evidence at all because I didn't know how to read that evidence for one. And if I ever tried, I didn't like what I heard. You're exactly. Your inner lawyer is like, no, we're bearing that evidence. Yeah, yeah. Because it made me immediately afraid, right? Oh, geez, no, I can't. Uh. But if you're a detective, you're not allowed to bury evidence. Right. It all has to be put together. With detectives, motive is a big thing they look for, right? Is this what would this person commit this crime? So let's use financial caretaking as an example, because this is behavior that you engaged in a number of times. And so there's a pattern there. And this is actually a really common one that I hear about and come across. So I think this could help people that have a similar issue where when I've heard that question, am I being codependent? It's often from that angle. Should I not be caring for this person financially because I've done this in the past? Well, let's look at it. When we talked about this number of times, when we described both the relationship with R and J, but let's get this brief history of your financial caretaking of R and J. There was a pattern there of financial caretaking with you. So let's go over some of the facts and the circumstances, which is the next thing to do. Let's review those facts and circumstances. Right. And and interestingly enough, we talked about these facts and circumstances long before I understood my codependency too, and and left it at that. (laughs) So I didn't understand. I was like, oh, I had bad luck. That's right. That these facts and circumstances just happened to be exactly the same, almost identical, to rehash what those are. So with R, this relationship started extremely fast. And, you know, I was confused. It was, it was love bombing. Like, and uh, I wound up moving in very quickly with her. And then very quickly after moving in with her, she quit her job. And the circumstances around that were her job was very difficult. It was very stressful. It was causing her a lot of uh, anxiety. It was affecting her. And she used it as an excuse for mistreating me. And I felt an overwhelming need to basically support that she should quit the job. And the circumstances with Jay were also very similar. Yeah, actually pretty much identical. She was stressed with her job. We moved in and very quickly after moving in, there was a reason why she couldn't, like certain financial things had to happen. She, But then as soon as those things did happen, until they happened, she was complaining and mistreating me for the same reasons and using her job as an excuse. This is really stressful. People at my work are being mean to me. Uh, I'm very tired and... You know, this is why I'm abusing you, basically, you know, without using that word. It was the same exact thing, right? And I don't remember exactly how the conversations went in either case, but somehow the idea was that they would both quit their jobs and I would take over the management of shared finances. And we're just talking just a matter of weeks of knowing these people. I was living with them and assuming sole responsibility for our shared finances. So there's the pattern. There's the you know, some broad strokes of the facts and circumstances. And then what were the, what was your motivation in, in each of these cases? My motivation in each of those cases was fear. In each case, I didn't acknowledge my motivation at the time, and I went quickly into rationalization mode, but my motivation was fear. It's, it's clear to me when I look back at the, at the time now, I felt as though I had no choice. So I also remember feeling in both cases, something is off here. This, this feels 
but especially once I got to J, because I was like, wow, this is the same exact thing. But then I couldn't really hold on to that thought because I had to go into rationalization mode because I felt powerless. And the way both of these relationships started in similar ways with love bombing and me moving in quickly and then feeling responsibility very, very quickly. And then also being a recipient of intermittent abuse and getting trauma bonded almost immediately in both relationships, um, I felt a lot of fear and a lot of shame of what would happen if I didn't allow this, basically. Like, yes, I hereby, you know, grant you the right to quit your job and I will, I will take care of you from here on out. You know, this may, may be obvious, but we should say it anyway. You did not talk to either of them about your fears no. or anxieties or concerns that this was happening. No, because I brought them into my rationalizations in the same way I was rationalizing it in my own mind. Like, oh, yes, well, I mean, I have this job. I don't plan on leaving it. I make a good amount here. So you lied to them. Yes. You lied to them that this was all fine, that mm -hmm. this was okay. You lied about your own feelings and your own needs in that situation. Right. Well, for one thing, I think I was ashamed of my fear because that's something we've talked about before, too. There's shame and then there's fear of shame and then there's shame of fear <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to where... I was like, I don't have a right. These people are telling me that their that their job is causing them stress and anxiety, and like, how dare I not tell them that they can quit their job and that I'll take over? Forget about the fact that we just met five weeks ago, but you know, still, this you know, we moved in together. That must, there must be a reason for that. That must mean that we have a relationship going here, and this is what people do in relationship. So I'm going into all these rationalizations, and then this is what I'm telling them. Oh, yeah, this is what people do. Couples get together, they pool their finances. This is not a problem. So there we have some serious evidence that you're being codependent because you were lying to yourself and you were lying to them. And I'm assuming that you lied to other people in your life as well about what was happening. Yeah, so the, the lies started immediately by lying to myself and to them that I didn't have any sort of reservations, that I didn't have any fear. And then the lying just continued from there because resentment set in. The situation just didn't feel fair to me. Once again, I didn't dwell on that at all. I didn't think about it, right? So this was, it just got internalized as resentment. And I carried that resentment and I would shame vent about it from time to time. To other people. But then if they challenged you on that. Then I would get defensive. And so the defensiveness would be, I would either be defending myself in my situation and the fact that I'm in this relationship and, no, oh, this is fine, all the stuff that I said right from the beginning, or I'd be defending the other person, like, why, well, how come they aren't helping with this or that? You know, like, that sounds kind of like a, not a very good situation. Oh, and then I'd be defending them. Well, they have to, but they, they don't feel good, whatever it is. Yeah, it's defensive. Defense attorney comes out. No, no big surprise. Answer to the question, were you behaving codependently? The answer is yes. Yes. And the biggest reasons, while there was a pattern and th that suggested that you were behaving codependently, and there were facts and circumstances that also suggested you were behaving codependently, but the biggest, the most important evidence that you were behaving codependently was because you were lying about the behavior yep. to yourself, to them, to other people, and that you felt resentment as if the behavior was not your responsibility or your choice, and you felt defensive when people challenged you on it. So we had financial codependency there. Now we get to our relationship and I recently quit my job. Before I did that, this question came up and this concern came up because we have a pattern of people you get involved with quitting their jobs. Yeah. And some of the facts and circumstances are the same in that I quit paid employment, you continued paid employment and become the sole earner. But on that second stage, collecting fact and circumstances, there were circumstances and facts that were very different, yeah. however. Right. For one thing, we didn't just meet each other and move in, <laughs> and then it just didn't happen immediately. So already that fact is way different. This happened four years into our relationship, five years into our relationship, after we were married, you know, like pretty significantly different already in the, right there. Secondly, you actually had a significant amount of savings and retirement earnings, and you were getting to a point to where even if I weren't in the picture, you would have been considering retirement. So this was a retirement, not a quitting of your job. 
you know, so that's very different. And we were financial partners. We had been talking about money for quite a, a, a good amount of time already. So I already felt safe in our relationship. We already had an established financial partnership. So that was very different. This was this was part of a larger financial plan that we had both of us worked on yeah. in terms of how we saw our shared financial life together. So even though this was a pattern for you, some of the facts and circumstances seem to be evidence that this was not codependent behavior. But again, the most important evidence comes from... The motive. The motive. Your motive for enabling me or helping me quit my job. Right. And this is something I, we checked in with ourselves about when we did that. How do you feel about this? Because basically the one fact that is going to be the same as previously, so let's make sure that this isn't a problem, is that you are going to stop working and I'm going to continue. And my salary is going to support our day-to-day -day expenses. So that's, that's the one thing that's going to be the same. How do I feel about that? So yeah, I looked for that out of evidence and I've continued to look for that evidence. So the motive here was that this was a partnership in which I felt safe and that I could actually discuss my concerns. And the fact that we had this conversation was evidence of that, you know, to where let's check, let me just check my emotions here and make sure I really am cool with this. That you feel like this is a choice that, you, that you're making. Yes, right. You don't feel that impulse to lie to me or you to other people about what's happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. And this impulse to lie, this lying behavior, that really is the most compelling evidence I can think of when you're looking to answer the question is, am I being codependent? Is, do you feel the need to lie? And... If you feel the need to lie consistently in your relationship, I would be concerned that this is a relationship that is kind of rife with codependent behavior. Because why do you need to lie to your partner? That's not a partnership. That means, like we talked about last episode, you are seeing this person not as a partner, but as a threat. And it doesn't have to mean that this person's an abusive person, mm -hmm. but for some reason, they're emotional life is a threat to you. So you have to lie. I mean, really, there's, like we've talked about, there's three entities in any relationship. There's the me, there's the you, there's the us. So if there's a need to lie, something is wrong with one of those entities. Right, right. So in your relationship with R and J, you felt the impulse to lie. Well, something was wrong with them. They were abusive people. You had the impulse to lie to them because they were a threat, because you were not safe. Right. You could not tell them, oh, I have a concern about you quitting your job, or I'm feeling resentful that you don't participate because you would get abused back. Right. I mean, I'd just be th I was thrown right back into where I learned these behaviors from. You know, my trauma was triggered. You would get anger directed at you. You would get shame directed at you. You would right. get verbal abuse. Okay. So me, you, and us. In that case, <laughs> there's a problem with the other person. But that doesn't have to be a problem with the other person right. to have an impulse to lie, right. right? I mean, they might be a fine person. You have lied to me, for instance, and <laughs> yes. I'm a fine person, and you lie to me all the time. You treated me as a threat a lot in right. early because in our relationship. Because there's this preemptive fear that either A, I can't handle your negative emotions, or B, you can't handle your negative emotions. I'm assuming you can't. Yes. Yeah, so or, in that case, or our relationship can't handle it, or something. <laughs> So in that case, the problem was you. <laughs> right. The problem wasn't the other person. The problem was you. Yes. Not being afraid of your own negative emotions, being afraid of my negative emotions. And you can't negotiate a relationship if you, because there are going to be negative emotions, mm -hmm. if you can't handle your own or the other person's feeling bad. And then it could be a problem at the relationship level. Like this is just not a relationship in which both people can feel safe. And so there needs to be some looking at that. How can this relationship be restructured so both people can feel safe? So if there's an impulse to lie consistently in your relationship, then yes, you are behaving codependently yes. in that relationship. And so the way it could look, say, if in, in our situation, let's say, you know, all these facts are the way they were, and we went ahead and did this, but we didn't have this conversation, and I had a reservation, and I didn't explore it, and you said, how do you feel? And I said, good, and I didn't explore it. I didn't tell you that I had a reservation. I didn't tell you that I was afraid. I just lied to you. Why didn't I tell you that? Because we can talk about that. 
It doesn't necessarily mean that there's a reason for that reservation. We can have a conversation about it. That I'm assuming that A, I won't be able to handle that fear or, or my fear is just wrong or whatever, or you, that's gonna, you, it's, you're going to negatively interpret that somehow. Like, well, what do you mean? How, what, what do you, why are you afraid? What's wrong with you? So I'm just going to choose to not even say it. So we, we're taking resentment and defensiveness too as evidence, but I don't think they're as compelling because both of those things can come up. And they do come up, I think, in every relationship. But the key is, how do you deal with them? Do you lie about them? Right. <laughs> or do you say, oh, I'm feeling kind of resentful. So, th- so this could happen with us as we move through you continuing to work paid employment. It's not like I do no work. <laughs> I just right. don't get paid for anything. Yeah, yeah. And then me having a different kind, different kind of day. You might start to feel some resentment, which is fine. That can just be evidence that we need to have another conversation. And we need, maybe we need to do some restructuring because we're partners. And I don't want you to spend your days feeling resentful. Why would I want that? Right. Yeah, you wouldn't. And I, and I wouldn't either. Like, well, how, how is that setting a good tone for our relationship? And there's no need because you can tell me that and we can have a conversation and figure out something that works for both of us. Similarly with defensiveness. I mean, obviously defensiveness can come up when both of us feel accused. I mean, there's just situations when sometimes, yeah, you kind of feel like a threat and I, or I feel like a mm-hmm. threat. And mm-hmm. there just has to be a reminder to ourselves and to each other that that's not the case. And that could look like me saying, like, I'm feeling kind of defensiveness. Well, and you've said, you know, we both said versions of this. We've been using these tools for a while now, and it's really had a huge help. Obviously, it's hard at first, you know, because if you actually are feeling resentful or defensive in the moment, it can be hard to take a step back and look at that because you're feeling defensive. And somebody telling me or asking me, are you feeling defensive? may make me even more defensive. So it's, it's, it's tricky, but I feel like we've, we've gotten re- pretty good at it. It's not as tricky as it might feel at first. So when we, you're trying to do this detective work around, am I being codependent in this relationship or in this situation? Again, looking for patterns is a great idea. Certainly collecting some facts and circumstances. And in both of those things, it might be helpful to have a partner <laughs> to do this detective work because especially an ex- maybe more experienced detective <laughs> because people who have struggled with codependency, again, are probably more practiced at looking at it with a lawyerly eye, trying to find the arguments and the rationalizations rather than looking at this kind of big picture, investigative, curious way to approach these situations. But anyway, looking for patterns, collecting some facts and circumstances, and then examining the animating emotions behind a list, the motivations behind these behaviors. And in that case, you know, the old saying, follow the money when you're trying to investigate a crime, it's follow the lies. Where are those lies coming out? Under what circumstances? And who are they trying to protect? Are they trying to protect yourself? Why do you need to be protected? What have you done? Right. <laughs> are they trying to protect the other person? Why are they trying to protect the relationship? But just to call back... You could see how easy it is to lie when you sever your emotions. I can conv- easily convince myself, I said, I'm feeling reservation or I'm feeling fear about this, but I'm going to lie and say I don't. But if I have this gatekeeper with my emotions and I sever them very quickly, I, I'm convincing myself I don't have the fear. So I'm not really lying, right? So that, that was my, what my defense lawyer did when I was in full triggered code. But even mode. with you... The body kept the score. Right? It did. Right? Like it would come out because you got to keep track of all these lies, first of all. Right. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, this is why I would hear different stories mm-hmm. or different versions of stories and why you would need feel the need to shame vent. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. other people can hear this. Yeah, this all gets lodged in there. We have a recent example, actually, of a way to illustrate this. This following the lies. Yes, following the lies where I felt compelled to lie to people and and I did I basically did this exercise of what we're talking about where I I tried to look at why I was feeling compelled to lie what the effects would be if I were to lie on me and on those people and it was a really good exercise because it, what I was doing was I was trying to see am I being codependent so what are the broad strokes of the circumstances here? Yeah, broad strokes would be this was a, a lifelong family friend, friends of my parents. Uh, so my parents' age, the woman died and her family was reaching out 
to me to come to a memorial service. And somewhere along the way, over the course of the years leading up to this, this woman betrayed me and betrayed my trust in her and made some choices that were very hurtful to me. And this took a long time for you to acknowledge. So you were, for a long time, you were lying to yourself about that. And you were lying to her and other people around her that this wasn't wounding behavior, that she was justified. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I rarely got together with these people anymore at this point because I had long since moved away from that city, but um, I still did every now and then, but I didn't have any real relationship with, with them. I mean, this is one of the things I realized is that I never talked to these people in between it was just sort of like get together at Thanksgiving sort of thing. Yeah, and not even every Thanksgiving or anything, just just occasionally. And it became even less and less occasionally by at, at some point. So by the time she passes away, you had acknowledged to yourself, at least, that you were wounded by her, that you did not have the relationship that you thought you had. Yes. And that you did not want a relationship with her. Right. Well, I had acknowledged this actually at least a few years prior to this. But you hadn't seen her since then. No, I hadn't. Right. So then she passes away and you get invited to the memorial, but she's not someone that you are interested in memorializing at this point. Right. Except that I'm immediately hit with the impulse to lie and go back to this, yes, we have a relationship. This person is important to me. That's, you know, we're family, things like that. And And you're going to travel across the country across the continent (laughs) (laughs) to go to a a memorial service the reason being i'm coming up with these justifications in my head well you know yes these were these they've always been family friends they didn't know i had that i felt this way these people are grieving it would be right for me to go to this for for those reasons so i need to basically go to this event that's honoring someone that i had already decided not only was not i didn't have a relationship but actually I felt betrayed by, and I was going to go honor this person. So you were going to cause yourself further emotional pain in order to maintain this attachment. Yeah, maintain attachment to a family that I didn't actually have any real reason to to maintain an attachment to. All of those reasons you came up with, family, friend, they're grieving, that wasn't the actual motivation because the motivation was... Fear. This, the same old fear, the fear of disappointing people, the fear of being seen a certain way. Oh, like, well, that guy's an asshole. How could he not go to a memorial service for someone he's known his whole life? So what will they think of me? Right. How will I be judged by some universe? Yeah, cosmic judge, <laughs> right. Yeah, what's going to happen if they feel any level of distress or disappointment? Mm-hmm. That's going to be my fault. I caused that. So you, to your credit, figured out pretty quick that you would not go. Right. Well, and and so yeah, I be, basically did the work of thinking about, okay, let's say I do go. Now I'm lying, right? I'm So the first layer of that is I'm betraying myself, right? I'm going to go and honor somebody that I don't want to honor. And then, so now I'm, I'm already, that's going to cause whatever problems that that causes, the problems that that's always caused my whole life, choosing attachment. And then now I'm also going to be lying to these people, like perpetuating this myth that I'm close to them, that this is a, a important relationship to me. And let's talk about a little bit about that, because I think people would, some people would say, well, of course you do that. Why wouldn't you do that for someone? But what you're doing is, as you're saying, is lying to them, is creating this expectation in them that you will be there for them when you don't want to be. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so what happens if in the future they need you to be there and you're like, well, I'm not going to be there because I'm not, I don't actually feel that way about you. Right. And why would they want that? You know, if they were to find that out, right. you'd be like, oh, geez, well, why did you come then? It's very disrespectful, actually. I mean, it seems like you're respecting these people by showing up for them. But if right. you don't care about them in the way that they think you do, then it's disrespectful to them. Mm-hmm. You don't respect them enough to think, you think you're so important <laughs> in their lives. This reminded me also of both of my narcissistic romantic partners that we've talked about so much in the series, R and J. They both did this on a regular basis with people that they met. They met and called their friends and 
to these people's faces, you're, you're so important to me. You're my, you're my bestie or you're, you're my favorite person in the world. And then ROJ and I go home and then it's just railing on them, everything that's wrong with them, how stupid they are. Obviously, there's a disconnect there, right? She doesn't actually think this about these people, but she's saying that to their face because that's the kind of attachment she needed. So, right. How is that materially different? It's not. Right. It's not really. <laughs> It's being inauthentic. And you're doing that so they won't think poorly of you, but why don't they deserve to know what you think of them? And this isn't saying that, and we thought about this too and talked about this, because it it was just really helpful to talk through all this, because I also just felt bad, of course, you know, like someone, these people just lost their mother, and that's in their grieving. And if I were to be called up by one of their children and asked, why aren't you going? I still wouldn't necessarily just say all this information oh it's because your mother betrayed me and like go you know i don't necessarily need to disclose yeah that's a good reminder you know not lying does not mean full disclosure yes (laughs) like you can be thoughtful about the other person you can still be compassionate and empathetic about what the person is going through just don't lie to them right of course the biggest lie would be just going and pretending that i have a relationship but then also I I'm not I don't necessarily need to come up with some elaborate lie why I'm not going either like oh yeah my my I uh, just I, I'm broke or something no I don't need to come up with a lie with that either it just doesn't need to be full disclosure so I was thinking if I did get that call I'd just be like well I can't make it I and I'm just going to leave it at that just, That's right you have an absolute right to privacy around that as well you're not obligated to tell people about your emotional pain Yeah and especially if I don't know the person and I don't feel the safe with the person And even if that causes them confusion or curiosity that is uncomfortable for them. Everyone's adults in this situation. Everyone's adults. Everyone's responsible for their own emotions. Right. And no one's entitled to information just because they ask for it. We can all help each other. You know, we're trying to take care of each other, but we take care of each other best when we're honest with each other and when we're honest with ourselves. So to sum this all up, though, you can see why this is especially important in a romantic committed relationship because when you're asking the question am i being codependent in this relationship you're asking am i lying in this relationship and that's critical because if you're lying in this relationship again something's wrong (laughs) with you with them or with the relationship itself and that needs to be looked at and some work to be done and we're going to continue in another couple weeks with more of the tools to make that happen to do that work. Thank you again for everyone who's listening and following along with us here. Uh, A special thank you for those that have bought the book and have commented on it or reviewed it or given it a star. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you very much. 